Dan Sisson is on the line. Dan is the, uh, the the author of the new book, The American Revolution of 1800, uh, which I I helped edit and uh, has my name on the cover too. But Dan's the principal author of this book. Uh, he's also the distinguished professor of American history and the revolution coming our way at the Tom Hartman University on the banks of the Potomac and an adjunct faculty member of the Eastern Washington University. Uh, where he teaches the history of technology in the engineering department. And uh, we are so pleased to have uh, Eastern Washington University helping deliver Professor Sisson to us. Sir, welcome back. Hello there, Tom. Hey, Dan. So Chapter 8 is the final chapter in the book, The American Revolution of 1800. And uh, let's. And this this is our Tom Hartman book club. Uh, if, you know, we're, we're, we've, we've been going through one chapter at a time every week, and and here is the last chapter. And uh, what what events occurred in 1800 that made not only Jefferson and Madison but also the Federalist realize that this election of Thomas Jefferson over John Adams and and others uh, was actually a revolution as opposed to simply a, an election. Well, you have to uh, go back to um, what we've been talking about now for weeks and weeks, and, and that is there were no such political parties. There was never a precedent in human history in which an election overturned an administration. And so all of a sudden, we have uh, a, a tied electoral college between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr um, at 65 votes apiece, and uh, there's no resolution. Jefferson tries to find Burr, and so does Madison, and he won't respond. And he's rumored to be in North Carolina. Then he's rumored to be in New England. And the, he will not respond by letter or by any messenger, which would be the, time, the, the best kinds of communications in those days. And so they start to realize that something is afoot. And meanwhile, there's all these rumors that are starting to circulate throughout the country, and especially among the leadership class. And the rumors had to do with things like the Senate was meeting to form a special committee in which they were going to elect a president, uh, which would have been unconstitutional. Right. Uh, and there were all kinds of uh, rumors about the Federalists willing to prevent um, an election of a new president because they wanted to have something called an interregnum. And what they were willing to do was to let the authority of John Adams expire on March 4th, 1801, in which there would be no executive to, to uh, make any order or to execute the laws. And so then they would either appoint a committee or a person like the Chief Justice or a select committee from the Senate to be able to do that. And the Chief Justice and, was a Federalist, and the, and the Senate was controlled essentially by Federalists or people. Absolutely. Of, so basically what we would call conservatives today. So these conservatives were essentially willing to say, if we can't get a conservative president, if we can't get, you know, uh, who, who was their candidate? Who were they promoting? Well, it would depend on who you were seeing. Hamilton, who had been the leader of the Federalists, had been promoting Charles Pinckney. Mm -hmm. And when Pinckney came in third in the voting or fourth, um, he realized the game was up, but he had squandered his leadership ability. And the more extreme Federalists were now beginning to negotiate. I mean, we hear this kind of talk, you know, even today between the Senate and the executive branch. And so basically they were saying, you know, Jefferson, um, we might be willing to vote for you, but you're going to have to guarantee that all of the Federalist policies uh, are going to be held in place and you're going to keep our friends in office. And um, Which is kind you of know, what, you know, John Boehner just said, you know, uh, Barack right. Obama saying that he's going to uh, veto our uh, a Keystone XL pipeline bill proves that he's not willing to work with us. So the, right, right on. And so what we're looking at are the preconditions for a situation that could turn pretty ugly in our time, just like it did in 1800. Hmm. And so when, when we uh, even go further into this, what we find out is that the high Federalists began to say that they were going to vote for Burr. Uh, Hamilton was no longer a major player at this point. And uh, their, their point man was a guy named James Bayard from Delaware, who was respected by everybody. And he was going around talking to all the emissaries from the Republicans, which represented Jefferson's and Madison's viewpoint. And then what we're, we're looking at is that the Republicans uh, decide that they're going to have to respond to this. And so basically they say, we're not going to cons you know, consent to anything that is not constitutional. All right. The Republicans, and, by the way, being the Democratic Republicans at that time, right. what we today call the Democratic Party, and, right. and really the, the progressives or the liberals of the day. The party of the people. Right. 
And we must remember that the Federalists were elitist. They were the wealthy. Right. They were the ones who controlled everything from the time that the government was founded. And they were in a state of shock by the events that unfolded. Because and Jefferson were, was not one of them. That's right. <laughs> it's exactly right. He resigned, in fact, uh, as Secretary of State so he could go back to Monticello and think about all this. Right. And so um, here we are. Uh, the, the, the tension keeps mounting. And, and uh, the meetings are being held everywhere, and the Republicans are saying free men are not going to accept usurpation even for one moment. And so they have this big conference in which um, uh, one of the, the major uh, players, he decides that he's going to stop um, the thing in its tracks. I mean, every, and all of a sudden you have a unanimity on the part of the Jeffersonians that they have to really seriously do something about this. And so then... Jefferson says, well, this is uh, reaching a point where of no return. We can't just make this claim and then go back on it. It's not subject to negotiation. So I'm going to visit the president of the United States and ask him personally, uh, is he willing to jeopardize that there's going to be violence and possibly civil war? So Adams goes to the White House and goes to see his old friend John Adams. And Jefferson Adams, goes to the White House and sees Adams. Right, yeah. right. and so he's shocked to find out that Adams is determined to keep the Navy. He wants to keep the tax policies. He wants to keep the financial policies. And he's telling Jefferson, you have to do this or we're not going to do anything about it. And Jefferson, by the way, at that point in time, was vice president to John Adams, was he not? That's right. Yeah. He sure okay. was. So. And so then what the, the, the events seem to overtake both of the men and the, uh, the leaders of both parties. All of a sudden, it becomes uh, people begin to realize there's over a hundred thousand people who have who are gathered in Washington D.C. on what is now the ellipse or the mall, and they're camped out, you know, and they're angry and they're vociferous. And, and relative to today's population, that would be like five or ten million people today. Well, there was only five thousand permanent population in Washington D.C. at this time. Wow! So you, all of a sudden, you realize you've got twenty times the number of people there, right. and they're threatening the lives of congressmen and throwing stones against. They had to clear uh, the the uh, Republican-dominated um, House of, or excuse me, uh, yeah, yeah, the House of uh, the Legislature, hmm. because somebody had threatened, like it was a terrorist attack, like a bomb. They were threatening to shoot people. And so all of a sudden, there was a panic that sort of gripped the air. Mm. And it's not just in Washington, D.C. We also find out that there were um, 22,000 men that had formed a militia, and the governor of Pennsylvania was leading them on a march toward Washington, D.C. We find out that there's 12,000 people in Virginia who have been uh, stationed you know, on emergency alert, and they've got a courier horseback going from Washington, D.C. to Richmond every four hours to tell them whether they should march on Washington. All the armories in Charleston, South Carolina and Philadelphia and New York City had been seized and the guns and rifles were given out to Jeffersonian supporters. All of a sudden in Baltimore, there is a group that's forming over 10,000 people and the realization begins to hit everybody that we are now looking at civil war and it's going to happen any hour. Uh, if we continue along this lines. Wow. And meanwhile, you know, this is um, how they finally say, well, the revolution is on, and Jefferson calls for an immediate constitutional convention so that they can decide what the future is going to be. Wow. Okay. And on that cliffhanger, we will be back with Dan Sisson in just a few minutes. Dan Sisson, the author of The American Revolution of 1800. Edited by Tom Hartman and available now in bookstores near you. Uh, stick around. We'll be right back. Tom Hartman University Book Club on the air. This is the Tom Hartman Program. The book is The American Revolution of 1800 by Dan Sisson. Dan, we'll be right back. So, Dan, we're on the verge of civil war because the the Electoral College vote for president is tied uh, between Jefferson and Burr. Do I have that right? That's right. OK, mm -hmm. so uh, what who is James Baird and what role did he play in preventing the civil war? 
Well, James Mayer turns out to be uh, a very interesting guy. And he is uh, one of the well-respected leaders among the Federalists. He's from Delaware, and he's sort of a caucus leader. And he's a person that everybody seems to have good faith in. He's also a lawyer uh, and a constitutional expert, a kind of you know a person that we see today who describes themselves as a constitutionalist. Mm-hmm. And um, he has integrity. So he's sort and, of like Ever Dirksen, uh, maybe. I would say that. Yeah. You bet. You know, a conservative who has some integrity. Yeah, and yeah. and, and the, the uh, I think that there's a Republican minority leader uh, later on. Where I can't remember his name right now, but he uh, was a similar kind of guy who everybody would listen to, and right. he could bring about some kind of uh, attention and compromise, even. And so he became the sort of front man who would negotiate with Jefferson's uh, primary negotiators, and. He was the first one who showed any inclination to um, soften the message that the hardcore Federalists were giving uh, everybody at that time. And he suggested that Jefferson at least accept in principle some continuity of the old Federalist system. Well, Jefferson replied to this that he was elected by the people and it would be unbecoming to him and to free men for him to go into office making any concessions. Now, remember, this is the second time that this has occurred. And so Bayard goes back, and Bayard is trying to make up his mind. Uh, The the high core Federalists at this point decide that Hamilton's candidate cannot be retrieved, and they hate Jefferson to such a degree that they're willing to vote for Burr. And the problem was that Burr could not be found. Burr would not appear to defend himself or to give his views or to be involved in any kind of negotiation. Why was that? Was he afraid of, I mean, he ultimately was shot to death by Hamilton. Was he afraid of something like that? Well, that's one of the great ironies, but that was in the future. At this point, I think that Burr was a a candidate who wanted to be drafted and was willing to become president. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about all this is that in these negotiations, both Jefferson and Madison are constantly looking for a constitutional solution to this problem. And Jefferson is on record as telling Bayard that he would be willing to accept the position of vice president for the next four years, the one that he had just been serving under Adams, if he could preserve the Constitution. And so he's appealing to a guy who is a, who is a self-styled constitutionalist and said, it's the Constitution and the Republic that are inseparable. It's the Constitution which protects everybody. And if what I understand my colleagues to be doing is willing to sacrifice the Constitution to put a guy like Burr into office who won't even appear to defend himself or give his views, this is insanity. Mm-hmm. And so he says, I'm going to break with the party and I'm in a faction, and I'm going to defend the Constitution. So he announces this in a meeting, and he is immediately threatened. And he says, I don't care. I'm willing to sacrifice my career. And Hold that, hold that thought right there, Dan. Hold that thought okay. right there. We will be right back with Dan Sisson. We're, we're creeping right up on the edge of revolution in 1800. The book, The American Revolution of 1800 by Dan Sisson. Stick around. It's 20 minutes past the Welcome back. So, 1800, the election is happening. The uh, Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson are tied in the number of electoral votes they have. The There are militias coming in from around the country. There's there's 100,000 people in Washington, D.C. throwing stones at members of Congress. And uh, they're, they're, we're, the country is literally on the brink of civil war. And James Baird, who is one of the leaders of the Federalists, one of the conservative mm-hmm. leaders, decides this is nuts. You know, we can't have a uh, a civil war. Yeah, we've only been a country for a couple of decades. Uh, we've got to do something. So where do we go from here, uh, Dan? Okay, so um, when you have a, uh, I mean, it's characteristic of a party that if they can give the appearance of unanimity, uh, even despite factions within the party, and this is what we see today even with factions controlling large portions of the Republican Party, that they're arguing among themselves 
and that Bayard is the one person who can resolve the problem. I mean, he can desert, and when he deserts and takes Delaware with him, as well as Maryland, he changes the numbers of the electoral votes and gives Jefferson the constitutional majority that he needed, which was nine votes. And so, uh, it, in a sense, uh, it's anticlimactic once this man makes the proper decision, a constitutional decision. But at the same moment, you have to realize that our system is almost geared so that it can bring these factions in competition with one another right up to the very edge of a civil war or a revolution. We wow. see that happen in the Civil War, of course. Yeah. Um, so th this is, uh, it seems to me, uh, this is one of America's uh, blessings, is that we're, uh, in, the, in the final analysis, when we have to really say we're going to overthrow the Constitution, we come to our senses and we say, we can't do this, and we have to abide by the rule of law. Yeah, there this you is go. The way I see. Now, yeah. I, often when you read history from the Revolutionary Era and the you know the first three decades thereafter, mm -hmm. um, you hear about party, you hear about faction, but rarely is faction described. I think most people don't know even what the word faction means, or certainly meant back in that day, and mm -hmm. what the uh, analogy is to today. What's your understanding of all this? Well, my belief is that uh, we haven't departed one whit from the politics of the early republic. If we look at our political system today and we see the various groups that make up a political party, and it's on both sides at different times, we can identify uh, some of those groups as factions whose interest is solely in their own concerns about power and not in the interest of a majority of the community. So they're not talking about what they're going to do is good for the nation. What they're talking about is what they're going to do that will advance the power of the political party that they represent. We haven't gotten away from that one bit. And um, the founders, you know, equated party with faction. And in the, in the historians and the political scientists, I believe, have made an artificial distinction between party and faction that doesn't really exist because I think the founders had a much better take on it and they were able to discern what the true direction of a party or a faction was in terms of how the people were acting in terms of interests. Mm -hmm. And we don't make those distinctions anymore. We just blandly talk about, well, the party does this or the party does that. Yeah. But it doesn't get us into a deeper analysis. And I think the founders were a lot more sophisticated uh, about their understanding of, of politics. The other thing is, you know, we've been just in the last five minutes going through all these these militias coming to Washington, the huge crowds, the threatening the lives of congressmen. Um, these are things that are totally absent from the description in any history that you want to think of that's written in our time. Right. I mean, the the, the two Why best, is that? I, I think they're just blind. I think that they would like to believe that America is going to, has gone onward and upward throughout its entire history, always to a greater realization or greater achievement. And they don't care what happened. They don't want to muddy the waters or give America I mean, I, I a read bad John name. I, I read McCullough's book on John Adams. And, yeah. you know, at, at the end of that book, there's maybe 40 pages where he's just mercilessly trashing Jefferson. But he never yeah. mentions any of this stuff. He doesn't even mention the Revolution of 1800, right. nor does Meekum. I mean, both of those books are probably the best sellers. The American public doesn't have any idea about the commitment to revolution that uh, the Jeffersonians had made. Right. I mean, it's really sad. Or that we damn near had a civil war in 1800, and, oh, and Thomas Jefferson saved the republic. That's right. And when you look at the people at that time who were the leaders, even in the Federalist Party, I mean, one of the great quotes that I think is marvelous is George Cabot when he, and he says, this is about three weeks to a month after uh, Jefferson takes office. He says, this is in New England. He says, we're all tranquil here, as they say in Paris after a revolution. Um, <laughs> Adams recognized it as being a, a change in the sentiments of people. Uh, Robert Troop, who was a uh, an operative in the Federalist Party, says democracy has made a marvelous revolution in the public mood. Uh, Matthew Davis, who was another Federalist operative, I mean, he's saying that the Revolution of 1800, he calls it that, uh, suggests that um, it was the overthrow of the Federal federal Party. Right. And Jefferson, uh, of course, called it that. Time. Yeah. And, and even like Fisher Ames, who was probably the most volatile writer of the period, he says, this isn't any little change of a cabinet scene. He says, this is a great moral revolution. 
uh, and Hamilton himself, I mean, the great architect, you know, of the Washington years and even partly Adams, uh, within six months, Hamilton is writing every Federalist and saying, we have to adopt the ways that Jefferson used, utilized to seize power in this country, meaning populism. Yeah, it's populism, but it's also a politics of revolution. Right. And it, Re- Hamilton is the one who really recognized this. Huh. You know, he was, he was attacking uh, Adams the whole time and totally oblivious. I mean, blinded by his own power and influence to see what was going on. But right. even he comes around and sees that it's a revolution. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So the revolution of the American Revolution of 1800 was actually a genuine revolution. We damn near had a civil war. We, we literally went from be- becoming a, a, a hard right-wing country to being a very progressive liberal democracy. Absolutely. With that that's, election. That's it. Yep. That's yeah. The okay. The book is The American Revolution of 1800. The author, Dan Sisson. Uh, that that we've, we've gone all the way through the book, so I hope it's been useful for you, and I hope you get a copy and you enjoy it. Dan, thanks so much for being with us. Absolutely, Tom. Great been talking. It's been great talking yeah. with you. It's been great working with you. And we'll, we'll do it again. Okay, guy. Thanks, Dan. We'll be back. 